Welcome back to the Gardening with Joy and Holly radio show. Moments away, Ashley Thomas, new author, will be with us. But first, a word from our good friends at Rise Garden. Rise Garden is a, is a revolutionary hydroponic gardening system for your home. Instead of food traveling hundreds or even over a thousand miles before it hits your plate, harvest the veggies, herbs, and greens you need for dinner tonight in the comfort of your home. No green thumb required knowledge. Gardening made easy with the Rise Gardens app. Step-by-step guidance from seed to harvest, a complete garden on a shelf, and comes with everything you need to grow healthy and the freshest food for you and your loved ones. Fully customizable with your garden to your needs and preferences. For more information and get your Rise Garden, visit risegardens.com. Hello, let's go to the hotline and bring in our guest for this week. Ashley Thomas is a columnist, author, and food security and home gardening advocate knowing, uh, known on social media as the Mocha, Gar- the Mocha Gardener. Her book, How to Become a Gardener, Find Empowerment in Creating Your Own F- Food Security, came out just a few months ago. Welcome to the program, Ashley. Thank you so much for having me here. It's a, it's a pleasure to chat with you guys tonight. Well, we are excited to have you on as we are. You, we know that we're going to learn from you uh, and you will teach not only us, but all of our listeners. I appreciate that. And I'm sure I'm going to learn from you guys. too. <laughs> Thank you. So, so what is food security and food empowerment? Yeah, so that's a a really great question because we often hear those terms thrown around, right? Um, So I will say that one is a bit more um, structured in its definition than the other one, and that's food security. Uh, By the official definition, and this was actually created by um, the United Nations, uh, the Committee on World Food Security, simply, you know, it exists when all people at all times have physical and economic access to sufficient safe and nutritious foods that meet their dietary needs and preferences for an active, healthy life. And I know that that sounds like so much, but it's very important um, that all of these needs be met in, in a person's diet. And then if there's food empowerment, which of course does not have a set or really a universal definition. Um, but if I had to describe this concept as really just kind of recognizing the power and the autonomy that individuals, you and me, that we should have around our food choices. Uh, But there's also this component where we as a community or society uh, can really uh, foster greater respect and consideration for people's food preferences. Uh, And we can do so with compassion while also educating and encouraging and improving access to the foods they need to not just survive, but to thrive. Well, what led you on to this food security journey? Where, was there an aha moment or, or something that as you grew up, you saw that this is where you needed to be? You know, I think that there's a little bit of both. Uh, there was the me growing up seeing and understanding what food security or food insecurity was. Uh, I didn't know that there was a term for it at the time. I just knew that, hey, we've got an issue with the quality of foods that we're experiencing um, and I really started to recognize this, um, you know, in my late teens, early 20s, um, all the way to like my 30s. And then I had what you call an aha moment in my mid 20s where I said, you know, I want to, I think that diet and what we eat is really determining, you know, the quality of life that we're living. And that was when I really kind of set out on this, this quest to eat better. Um, but I kind of combined that with my love for nature, the environment, and of course, a little story that I have in my book on gardening and how I got into gardening to really incorporate all of those things to really gain access to the foods that we need. And and as we all get older, older, we realize whether we want to admit it or not, the potato chips that we ate at 18 or 20, that eh, it's not so bad. They have more of a dangerous effect on us when we're 38, 42, 50. Yeah, especially if we're eating it every day. Right. So I will say, you know, me studying nutrition, I, you know, I'm, I'm not one to say, hey, don't eat the potato chips at all, because sometimes we get a craving mm-hmm. for it. But if we find ourselves eating it only uh, and, and in abundance too much uh, or where we're overindulging, that's where we start to see some challenges. Absolutely. And I think um, as Holly points at me, (laughs) I think that (laughs) I know I personally strive to eat a variety of foods and 
sometimes I have to encourage Joey to, to do the same. So um, your book, How to Become a Gardener, Finding Empowerment and Creating Your Own Food Security, looks like a great book. Mm-hmm. Tell us something unique or interesting about it to encourage our listeners to pick up a copy. Yeah. So I know um, I, I like what you just did, Holly. You <laughs> talked about encouraging Joey. And really, that's ultimately what we're all trying to do, um, being mindful of everyone's choices. And, and we're all on this walk of wellness together. Everyone is trying. I'm trying to. So in my book, you, you know, I, I speak about not just learning how to garden, but really how to become the person that cultivates these spaces, whether it be, you know, the green spaces or the spaces within your community or in your home that uh, ultimately fosters greater wellness. So how to become a gardener is a gentle guide where if you could imagine walking with me uh, through my garden and uh, gardens of many other gardeners uh, and, and how we got on this journey, what food means to us, what gardening means to us, uh, what does it mean to be a gardener and helping others to understand that none of us are born with a green thumb. We cultivate it, we grow it, and we develop it over time. So, um, I, I think it's a it's a good read, um, especially with bringing some of these, you know, tough concepts like food security, food empowerment. I think that it would it, it's something that will resonate with everyone because I don't know about y'all, but I love food and we all need food <laughs> to eat to survive. Yeah. Yes. Yes. <laughs> I, I can't agree more. I am curious. I know I saw on your Instagram that you showed your grandparents that they were in your book. Were they involved with your gardening journey? Is that how you got into gardening or did they inspire oh. that book somehow? Oh, yeah. So my grandfather uh, was, a, was a farmer um, in South Carolina. And, you know, as they aged, you know, they stopped farming. But he always maintained a small garden uh, and, and just like to grow, you know, little little produce items, but it wasn't enough food to really provide the nourishment that we needed in our household, especially where we were located, which was a rural community. And so, you know, I kind of took, watched my grandfather, you know, do this garden and he's growing foods. And I was like, wait, this is the aha moment, Joey, right. when I said, wait a minute, you mean to tell me we can grow an abundance, all types of foods just like this? And so that's when it dawned on me that if we don't have access to the foods that we need, why not be empowered to create access using whatever space we have? And it's not the the solution to everything, but um, I found that that, it it brought back power to the individual. Um, And my grandparents, you know, kind of, you know, we we are all now, I moved, my family and I, we moved up, up to North Carolina. We moved them up to North Carolina as well. And they've been a very active part of, you know, learning some of the organic practices of, of gardening uh, that I've been, you know, kind of showing them. And, of course, I glean wisdom from my grandfather because, I mean, that's my grandpa. Right. He's got so many years in, of experience to share. But it's also been a, a wellness journey for them and understanding foods uh, from an, a totally different light. So, you know, they were just here this evening helping me prepare for the spring garden. So, yes, they've been a very active component in our garden journey uh, and an inspiration for me. And I'm sure your grandparents are much like many of the grandparents uh, that are listening or uh, of the grandparents of people who are listening. They can grow and bake things that we just cannot do. They, I mean, listen, they, they just know stuff. <laughs> yes. So, my grandfather just knows things that yeah. he did not have formal education in horticulture. He learned this, right. you know, just through experience. And that is invaluable. I think it's really just the, uh, me being, recognizing my role as a granddaughter. There's always something that I can learn. And he drops gems and little life wisdom uh, for me and my husband. Every day or every time we're in the garden. So I cherish those moments with him. Yeah, you got to absorb it because you just don't know when that time is no longer going to be with you. um, And and you got to cherish it. Exactly. Well, what is is a what is, what do you feel in your opinion is a common hurdle that stops or hurdles that stop many people from gardening, and how can they get over that hurdle to get them to garden? Yeah. Yeah. So I think so. There there might be two things. 
either for the for the new and experience uh, new and inexperience, I fall in between, like veteran and new, because I, I still have so many years to learn. Uh, I will never know everything, um, but I think that there is this element of not being as productive or as successful as you thought you would be, and then for the veterans, just experiencing challenges that just knocked you off your your growing game and just not meeting expectations. So I think um, to both of those, uh, you know, those groups, I say, you know, uh, start small, start within your, within your means and um, just recognize that nature is uncontrollable. So it's going to, we're all going to get disappointed at some point, but it's in the disappointments that it builds character. And it offers us uh, an opportunity to learn more about uh, what's around us, our environment, the organisms within the environment. So never give up. And and even if you have to stop or take a pause, that's okay. Be gentle with yourself. And, uh, you know, don't you look at what's within, you, what's in your own means, not necessarily the means of every, everyone else around you. Well, successes are easy. We, we all joy in successes. <laughs> it's that disappointments is those life learning moments yes. that uh, we can't achieve any other way. Yeah. Yeah. So exactly. you, get, you have been getting sap from maple trees. If somebody does want <laughs> to, to try that process, is there anything you would you would recommend to get them started and something that they might want to consider before they run down to the uh, maple sap supply store? <laughs> um, I'm so glad you said that about the maple sap supply store. I will say nature provides us with so many opportunities to learn and explore. Uh, so long as we, are, we have a mindset to research and be uh, helpful and beneficial, not harmful uh, to nature. So for me, I have to say, I am not a a maple sap tapping expert at all. (laughs) I actually don't, I I don't live in a climate where we can do it quite frequently. Um, But if you live in a climate that experiences, you know, seasons of freezing temperatures, you might be in luck. I definitely recommend maybe exploring your uh, extension sites or agricultural sites, uh, local agricultural sites, to really get some um, advice on the types of trees in your areas in which you can tap. So there is a is a window of time where you can tap the trees, and it's typically between mid-February and mid-March. I happen to trap my, tap my trees in mid-February. Um, so if you are in, you know, like a colder climate right now, you might still have a quick opportunity to try this. But some of the trees that you really want to maybe explore is, uh, you know, pretty much all of the species of the maple trees. They're nice and sugary. Um, and, you know, you, you want to make sure that you, you're doing this um, when there's a consistent phase where the temperatures drop uh, below freezing at night and above freezing, uh, say, around 45 to 50 degrees during the day. And that's really to concentrate the sugars within the trees. There's a science to it. I'm not going to bore you with all the details, but just know that it's really cool how trees produce this sap. And then lastly, you know, um, I will say that, you know, you, you want to make sure that you're pasteurizing it or boiling the sap before you consume it because, um, like anything outdoors, there could be pathogens uh, that, you know, harmful pathogens or that could be transferred uh, through the trees to your containers. And then you can store it, make sure you refrigerate it. So it's a fun, fun, fun activity. Um, I love to do this with my little nieces and nephews and everyone really enjoys it. And it's just, it's a lot of nutrition from, from nature. It's another source of nutritious foods. Absolutely. Well, Ashley, greatly appreciate the time you've offered Holly and my Holly, and myself, and our listeners. How can people find your book and find out more information about you? Yes. So, how to become a gardener, find empowerment, and creating your own food security can be purchased uh, on all major retailers uh, all around the world. Um, you can go to Amazon, Barnes and Noble, uh, Bookstore.org. I think um, to really just. You know, you can look in those locations. And also, I welcome you to follow me on all social media platforms, primarily Instagram and Facebook at The Mocha Gardener. Um, I love to chat with people. So feel free to, you know, send me a message or email me at 
d.mocha.gardner at gmail.com. Thank you guys so much. Absolutely. We thank you for your time. For more information, please visit the WisconsinVegetableGardener.com.